Thanks, you guys, so much. Thank you. Hey, good evening. How you guys doing? Cool, man. So, I was thinking during worship, th- come up with some biblical names for our God. What, how does Scripture refer to God? What are some of the ways that Scripture refers to the Lord? Just shout those out. The Almighty. Yahweh. The Great I Am. The I Am. Comforter. What's that? Adonai. The Alpha and the Omega. The God Most High. These are all great, great names about our God. These are all truthful things about our God. He is Almighty. He is the God Most High. He is the El Shaddai. He's a lot of incredible things. He's the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And sometimes we lose sight of that, don't we? We we know that to be true. If somebody were to say, is God all those things, we'd say, well, of course He is. Of course He is. But boy, it's easy sometimes to lose sight of that through the day, through the week, through the month, in our relationships, in our job situations, in our health. Whatever that might be, we can lose sight of all those things that we know to be true about our God. And He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Those truths about Him will remain for forever. And I'm just, I, I feel like God is just stirring in my heart for this, for this church. That He is great, that He wants to do great things, that He's still doing great things. And He wants to just completely consume the life of this church. Each and every one of you, each and every little people group that you're in or that you need to be in, the people outside these walls that He wants to do in this church and in every church that proclaims His name. He wants to do great things. And so I am going to be praying, and I want to challenge each person here to be praying with great expectation for that God, that great God, that almighty God, the most high God, to do incredible things here so that when He does those things, we have nowhere else to look but to Him and just say, only you could have done that. Only you could have done that. Clearly, I'm incapable of doing anything great. But I'm very capable of knowing who to turn to who can do those great things. And so it's a challenge for me and a challenge for each one of you to have incredible expectations for every resource that we are as a body of Christ, as a building, every dollar, to do amazing things. Because God's still writing in that book of life and He's still writing stories. Amen? Amen. Thank you for letting me do that. I just believe God wants to do amazing things. He wants us to trust Him for amazing things. We are in Ephesians chapter 6. A few more weeks we'll be done with Ephesians. Just like that, we're in verses 1 through 4. And, you know, I titled it The Family Fortune that we all, as part of the family of God, are rich and blessed beyond our wildest dreams when we live in submission to one another, when we live in submission to our Lord. That's the family fortune. That's the family fortune that is talked about already in Ephesians 1. Let me open with a couple different things. So this is about, you know, our verses are about children obeying your parents. Well, we don't have children in our audience. This is not where we have them. But that's okay. I'm going to kind of hit this from a different angle. But we'll, we'll get started with these few things to kind of loosen up our lungs a little bit. One particular day, a certain wonderful young little boy was riding his bicycle feverishly around the block of his neighborhood. And round and round this young little lad went, crying with every turn of the pedals. A very caring and concerned police officer got sight of this young boy riding and crying and said to him, Excuse me there, young man, I would love to know where you're going. The little guy replied, well, I'm running away from home, of course. Very politely, the police officer brought to the boy's attention that he had not gotten very far. Heck, he hadn't even made it to the other side of the street. The boy 
after the officer reminded him of this, quickly fixed his gaze upon the officer and he furrowed his brow and he smartly countered back, yeah, I know, but it's only because I'm not allowed to cross the street. <laughs> Cute kids, right? Many people spend more time training their dogs than they spend training their children. Our puppy dog just graduated today. He graduated from 10 weeks of obedience school, right? Apparently I'm next. <laughs> Norm is now a graduated obedience school dog. Some parents think that by sending a kid off to college, they're getting rid of them. When they, what they don't realize is that by sending them away, what they're really doing is increasing their phone bill, their fuel bill, and the amount of time they spend counseling them from afar. Parenting will always be hard, hard work, right? Lastly, a certain man used to lecture on raising children. Having been a professor for quite some time, he had the privilege of lecturing through his single years without kids and then now in his married parenting years. Needless to say, his lectures evolved over time. When he was single and without kids, he used to term his lecture series the Ten Commandments for Parenting. After his first child, he had to change the title to the Ten Hints, H-I-N-T-S, the Ten Hints for Parenting. After the second child, it became the Ten Suggestions for Parenting. When he had his third child, he stopped lecturing. <laughs> Let me give you this encouragement from Proverbs 22, verse 6. We know this proverb. Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. That's, Proverbs are generally true. We, we don't take them as true in every situation, but it's generally true. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to read our four verses, and then we're going to pray. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. Ephesians 6, four verses. Chil children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on, on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we are in this section of Ephesians that Paul is talking about of submission, where he says in verse 21 of chapter 5 that we are to be submissive to one another. And in this section, we're talking about children being submissive to their parents and fathers in return, bringing them up in the ways of the Lord as the submission in return to the children. And so, Lord, if, if we're in that place, Lord, help us to do that well. Lord, for all the parents in, in our church and Lord, we, we lift them up to you as well and pray, Lord, that you give them wisdom on how to raise up their children in the ways of the Lord, that they would instruct them well, that they indeed would be submissive as you've taught us to all be submissive. Lord, have your way with us in our text this evening, we pray in the mighty name of Christ. And everyone said, amen. So here's our, we only got a few verses. Here's the first three verses. Here's the outline. We're going to talk about kids that are killing it. Killing it kids. Kids that are being obedient in the Lord. And then we're going to talk about dialed-in dads, dads that are dialed in on how to bring up their children in the ways of the Lord, okay? Let's reread verses 1, 2, and 3 about the kids. Chapter 6, verses 1, 2, and 3. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And then it refers back to some Old Testament Scripture. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with the promise. So that it may be well with you, and that you may live long on the earth. So let me, let me give you kind of Paul's setup here. This, right, see, this is Ephesians is not, you know, we put in the chapters and verses, right? So this is just one big letter. The setup for this goes back to chapter 5, verses 15 through 21. This whole section of, of submission, okay? So let's go back to Ephesians 5, 15 through 21. 
Ephesians 5, 15 through 21, where it says, Be careful how you walk. That we're to walk not unwisely or foolishly, but wisely. And we're to make the most of our time because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand the will of God. And then verse 18, one of the key verses, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but we are to be filled with the Spirit of God. And then in verses 19, 20, and 21, there's three things that will happen when we're filled with the Spirit of God. Verse 19 says that we'll be joyful. Verse 20 says that we'll be thankful. And verse 21 says that we will be submissive. So when we're filled with the Spirit of God, we'll be joyful, thankful, and we'll be submissive to the Lord and to one another. Okay? And so then he starts in verse 22 with what that looks like. Right? So in verses 22, 23, and 24, right, being filled with the Spirit, we're joyful, we're thankful, and now we can be submissive. If we're not Spirit-filled, all this is going to break down. We're not going to be joyful, we're not going to be thankful, and we're going to have a difficult time being mutually uh, submissive. Make sense? So Ephesians 5, 22 23 and 24, which Pastor Dave co uh, covered a couple weeks ago, is about wives being submissive to their husbands, and it also talks about uh, the church being submissive to Christ, right? And then it goes into verses 25 through 33, which we covered last week, about uh, husbands loving their wives as Christ loved the church. And so that's the way the husbands submit to their wives, that they love their wives in such a way, right? It says, just as Christ loved the church. And so that's the husbands then submitting themselves to the Lord by serving as Christ did the church by serving their wives. And then now we get into verses 1, 2, 3, and 4 in chapter 6 about children submitting to their parents and then fathers submitting to their kids in the ways that they bring them up, doing the work that they need to do as fathers in a mutual submission role by bringing them up in the instruction and the discipline of the Lord. And then after that, next week will be verses 5 through 9 about slaves and masters and masters and slaves, which is employers and employees, and how that's supposed to work. And so all that goes back to being filled with the Holy Spirit and being mutually submissive to one another. So this is all just one big discourse, if you will, that all goes together. You with me? So the bottom line is this. This is the bottom line. that <laughs> The Spirit-controlled life, chapter 5, verse 18, is essential. It's essential. The Spirit-filled life, chapter 5, verse 18, is essential for proper godly relationships. That's what it means. We cannot have proper scriptural godly relationships outside of being filled and empowered by the Spirit of God. Amen? Okay. Kids, right? Kids like the rest of us. That's why I'm giving you this big picture. Children are no different than us. We don't say you get to submit until you're 18 and then you don't, you don't have to submit anymore. We're all, all of us are in a place of submission until the day we breathe our last. All of us. So kids, like the rest of us, are called to submit. Kids, like the rest of us, are to be filled with the Spirit. Going back to 518. Hmm. See, <laughs> childhood is the training ground for the rest of their life with the Almighty, which is a life of submission. So it's not that they just have to submit for a period of time until they become adults. It's the training ground for a lifelong submission process of the, to the Almighty, right? And so it's just a bigger picture. So instead of just saying, obey your children in the Lord, oh, it's, it's just it's so much more than that. It's the training ground for the rest of their life with the Almighty, with their brothers and sisters in Christ, with the church, with other churches, with everybody, mm, with their employers or their employees. So parents, we must be diligent and loving always asking the Holy Spirit to have a deeper and abiding presence in our children. That's what we can do from this end. If I'm not preaching to the kids, then I'm going to preach to the parents, right? Have a diligent, be diligent, be loving, always asking the Holy Spirit to have a deeper and abiding presence 
in our kids because that's the life that they will have forever, a life of submission, which can only be done through the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? We good on that? Okay. It's not simply, as I mentioned, that, that children are to obey their parents. That's obvious. But it's a lifetime of godly and mutual submission that awaits them. And so that just helps us to understand this as parents a little differently. It's not just to get them to a certain age. It's not just to get them to a certain job. It's preparing them for a lifetime of submission. All of us, I've said this before tonight, all of us as followers of Christ are called to submit. All of us. All of us as followers of Christ are called to a life of submission. Look again at chapter 5, verse 21. Be subject or submissive, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. So the greater lesson for our children is more than simply obey your parents. It's teaching them the bigger picture of submission that's found in all of Scripture. All of Scripture is about submitting as Christ did to His Heavenly Father, as we do to Christ. And so that's what we're really trying to teach our children is the full counsel of God, a lifetime of submission. Here's what I think is really, really cool for me. Look at the means that God has provided in this section, okay? Through, so I'm, I'm going to say this and then I'll unpack it, okay? Through our fear and reverence of the Lord, through our fear of the Lord, which is verse 21, I'll show you in a second, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and I'm talking verse 21 of chapter 5, right? So through our fear of the Lord and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we can live lives in that sweet spot that we were created for and perhaps we're still longing for, right? That's the means that God has provided, that through our reverence of the Lord, through our fear of God, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we have the ability to live in the sweet spot that we were created for, a life of submission. And many of us are still longing for that. We just don't feel like we're in that sweet spot in life. And like, what is it? What is it? Well, maybe it's our fear of the Lord is off and it's our submission to the Holy Spirit's off. Or we're not filled with the Holy Spirit. We're not relying on the Holy Spirit. Okay? So see in verse 21, it says, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. This submission, this uh, lifestyle of submission comes from a healthy fear and understanding and reverence of who God is. And then saying, oh, because I know who He is, I do indeed need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So those are the means by which we can live in that sweet spot that God has designed for us to live in, having a healthy fear of God and a health, healthy dose of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Amen? Okay? So, so check out this, this fear, this reverence. L- listen, I'm going to say this in the beginning and then I'm going to say it at the end. But listen, I believe... I believe that a proper fear, a proper fear, reverence of God, will lead to a proper filling. A proper fear of who God is, understanding the Almighty, all those names we gave Him, that the more we fully understand who God is, a proper, what's the word I used? Fear. So, gosh, a proper fear is what leads to a proper filling. And so God does things. You've heard that saying that, you know, sometimes we don't, it's not until God knocks us on our back that we look up. He, he, he allows things to happen to us so that we have a proper understanding, a proper fear, which is a reverential fear is what that means, right? So that when we have a proper fear, then we really reach for the Holy Spirit. We rely on the Holy Spirit because our fear is, is, is lined up. And so our feeling then is lined up. Hmm. Do you know it talks about the fear of God all throughout Scripture? I'm going to give you just a few, like 10. It was so hard not to give you like 50. It's so fun. But I want us to understand that this, I believe, is where it starts. And so God allows things out of his love for you and I, for us to have a healthier fear of who he is, a reverential fear, so that we will just reach for a proper filling of his power and his Holy Spirit, so that we can live in the sweet spot that we're designed for. Check this out, Proverbs 9, uh, verse 10. 
The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. This is the one that we all know, I think. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. The fear of the Lord is when we start to figure things out. That's the beginning of wisdom. We must have a fear of God. Check out Proverbs 10, 27. The fear of the Lord prolongs life. That's in our verses from Ephesians 6, right? That you may live long and that it, be, it would go well with you. The fear of the Lord prolongs life, but the years of the wicked will be shortened. Look at Psalm 25, verse 14. The secret of the Lord is for those who fear Him. The secret is His counsel. It's intimacy with God. His leading you and guiding you. The secret of the Lord is for those who fear Him and He will make them know His covenant. Check out Psalm 33, verse, verse 8. <laughs> Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. And that's a word that we didn't use. Is He's awesome. He's awesome. Psalm 33, uh, did we do 8 or eight? What, Which one was that? Oh, I... Did we do 8 and 18? Or did we skip one? We skipped 8? Which one was on the screen last? We didn't have 8? Oh, so I read the wrong one. So this is 18. Leave that up there because I missed that one. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear Him, on those whose hope is for His loving kindness. Psalm 34, 7. Thank you. Psalm 34, 7, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he rescues them. Oh, I like that. We need that often, don't we? Hey, if you've lived long enough and you look back and you think, oh my word, the things that the Lord rescued me from. Right? Stupid stuff, man. I mean, stupid stuff. How much time we got? I'll give you about a hundred stupid things just off the top of my head. Psalm 103, verse 17. But the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear Him and His righteousness to our children's children. Oh, thank you, Lord. Even Job, in all this turmoil, Job said, in Job, he says, and to man, he says of God, behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. And then lastly, Proverbs 19, 23. The fear of the Lord leads to life. Look how cute this is when we're talking about kids. So that one may sleep satisfied, untouched by evil. I'll say it again. I believe that a proper fear will lead to a proper filling of the Holy Spirit. A proper fear will lead to the proper filling. Hey, look. Look. I, I recognize, as I'm sure many of you do, if not all of you, that God loves me enough, loves us enough to continue to shape a proper fear in our lives. I've got to be honest with you. I don't dig it. I don't, I, and I'm not saying I don't dig it that often. I don't dig it ever. I don't know if, if you do, right? I just, don't, it's just not, I just don't dig it when it's happening. But I recognize that it's essential. I recognize that as, as he's shaping, recalibrating my proper fear, it's because he wants me to have a proper filling. And so for that, I'm in incredibly grateful. And then I have to trust him in that process. And then in turn, in our context, it leads to godly submission. Proper fear, proper filling. That's how we can do all these things in all these relationships. Amen? Okay, so a few other things from these three verses. One, Paul, Paul did not tell the parents to caution the children in these verses. He did it himself. He says, children. He's talking to the kids. He's writing to the kids. We, we must expose our kids to the Word. And along with the Holy Spirit, teach them to wrestle with truth at all times in their lives. Wrestle with it. Wrestle with it. Expose them to truth. Did they understand all that Paul wrote? Maybe not. Do we? Do we? Hey, look. I, I, I don't know. I, I may have shared this here. You know, I, I, uh, uh, how do, how, how's the story go? So, I got drugged to church, perhaps like many of you. 
right? And I'm like, ah, oh, man, you know, like I'm a rebellious, you know, five-year-old and a rebellious 10-year-old and then a rebellious 15-year-old, right? Like I don't want to go to church, right? I never went to youth group. I never, I just got drugged to church and sat in with the big people. I didn't, never went off to, never, 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 never went to Sunday school, never. But I heard the gospel every weekend. Did I understand it? Over time I did. Over time I did. And, I, and, when, and when the Holy Spirit started kind of probing my heart, I knew what I knew what I knew. I knew I needed to learn a lot more, but I knew enough. We need to expose our kids to truth. Do they understand it all? It's okay if they don't. Trust the Lord with all that stuff. So many times we're trying to shield because we, don't, we think they can't handle certain things. I think the opposite is true. Second thing from these verses is that understanding is not a criteria of obedience. <laughs> Understanding is not a criteria of being obedient. That develops over time, doesn't it? Sometimes we just have to obey. We don't necessarily know why or how it all works. Nonetheless, in these verses, it doesn't say once they understand, obey your parents. It says children, obey. And so with that, you'll see that it's right in verse 1. You'll see that there's a promise that they'll, it'll go well with them and that they'll live long. That there's promise, whether they understand or not. And so the same is true for us, right? That if we just obey, regardless of whether we understand how the Lord's working, that it's the right thing to do. It has a promise. It'll go well for us. And we'll, live long, we'll have a, a nice long life of, of living well with the Lord. So parents, as, as children of God, do you and I do what's right? Do you and I do what's right? If, if we have kids, we're, we're children of God. And so if we have children in the Lord, do you and I do what's right ourselves? So if it says, children, obey your parents for this is right, what about us? Do we obey God? Because that's right also. See, <laughs> our kids see everything. Our kids pick up on so much. And so it's a great challenge for us when it says, children, obey your parents, for this is right in the Lord. It's like, mom and dad, obey the Lord, for this is right also, and your kids are watching. And so Paul, he doesn't, say just, he doesn't just say obey, but he points them back to the word. And he quotes two different things, parts of uh, Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments, and then Deuteronomy 5 about the promise of it going well with them. So you can do that on your own, right? So he points them back to the Word from the Old Testament thousands of years before. See, the main thrust of obedience is not them obeying us. It's, all, it's about all of us being submissive to the Lord and His bigger, greater, continual purposes. And so Paul's not saying obey just to obey. He's saying Look, this is part of who we are. It's part of who God is. It's part of his divine purposes for all of us. And it's been that way from the beginning. And so he refers back to Scripture from Exodus and Deuteronomy. It's for us to understand the full counsel of God, which I said earlier, and the blessings that we have when we live lives of obedience and lives of humility and lives of submission and lives of servanthood. That's what Paul is trying to get kids to understand. It's not just obey your parents because they're your parents. It's to get them to understand the big picture, that it's a life of blessing when we live in how God wants us to live, and it's been that way from the beginning. And then third, this promise. When it talks about this promise, right? Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with the promise. Verse 2 tells us that this is the first commandment with the promise, but in reality it's actually the second and you can look in Exodus 20 if you want to get that figured out. And per, there's a few different theories. Perhaps Paul meant for this to be the, the first command that children need to learn. But it's actually the second one that lists a promise, and we just don't have time to go into that. But regardless, this states a general principle. What Paul is doing, he's stating a general principle that obedience fosters self-discipline. Obedience fosters self-discipline, which in turn brings stability and longevity in one's life. When children obey their parents in the Lord, they escape a good deal of sin and danger and avoid things that could threaten or shorten their lives. But life is not measured only by time, but also by quality of experience. And so God enriches the life of the obedient, no matter how long he may live. 
Sin always robs us. Obedience always enriches us. Sin always robs us. Obedience always enriches us. And that's what Paul wants children to learn. And so many of us here, perhaps now, perhaps yesterday, perhaps next week, we desire this stability, this longevity, yet we resist obedience and self-discipline. <laughs> and that's the lesson that Paul, and the Lord, wants us to learn very early on. That we can live lives of stability, lives of longevity, lives of, 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 of escaping sin. But we resist the obedience and the self-discipline that creates that. Let's read verse 4 one more time about these dialed-in dads. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. So fathers are addressed. Why? Because they represent the, the governmental head of the family where the responsibility of the child discipline resides. They are the head of the household. That's what God's called fathers to be. And so ultimately, the discipline falls on both parents, of course. But the dad plays a major role, the key role. And, and, and here's just, I don't know how else to say it, but man, we, there's just some things we must not delegate. There's just some things we must not delegate. And discipline's one of those things. Loving and bringing them up in the ways of the Lord. And too often, the dad, or maybe even the mom, or both, have delegated that discipline and the instruction of the Lord to somebody else. And it's not to be that way. It's for the father and for the mother. And so it's interesting to me, it just kind of made me sad where I, I said to myself, I wrote here, why does this reality seem like such a fairy tale to us? Why does this reality seem like such a fairy tale where husbands, going to last week's message, agape their wives, and then husbands bring up kids in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord? That's almost like a movie. That doesn't happen, does it? Do husbands today agape their wives and bring up their children in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord? It just seems like it's a lost art. It's almost like, oh, is that possible? Yeah, that's the Lord's plan for us. How then, it says not to provoke our children to anger. How do we provoke our children to anger? Unreasonable demands, for sure. Petty rules, favoritism, inconsistency, always blaming and never praising, making promises and not keeping them. See, there's a parallel verse in this passage that we're in Ephesians, in Colossians chapter 3. We won't get into all of it, but verse 21 of Colossians, I think we have that up, right? Colossians 3, 21. No, no, I didn't put that up. I was just going to share it with you. My bad. It says, this is what it says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they will not lose heart. What that means is so they won't be discouraged. We are not to discourage our children. We're not to exasperate our children. Fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they will not lose heart, so that they will not be discouraged. And so here's an interesting challenge. I wonder, for those of us who have kids, that is worth asking, are you willing to ask your kids if you're discouraging them in any way? Am I discouraging you in any way? I just wonder what kind of response we would get if we were to be honest or ask them to give us an honest answer. There's a couple articles, too many to share. I'll give you a few. This was four ways parents discourage their kids. This one, four ways parents discourage their kids. You offer too much help. You compare them with others. You always expect more, and you minimize their victories. So if some of those resonate for you, let the Lord talk to you about that, right? You offer too much help, you compare them with others, you always expect more, you minimize their victories. That discourages kids. Another one is three ways parents discourage their children. Acting or disciplining erratically or inconsistently. Second one, passively implying that you do not care. And the third one, I love, failing to model courage. Failing to model courage. If you don't model courage, they're going to not be encouraged. They're going to be discouraged. We are to be fierce for our kids, mom and dad. So instead of provoking our children to anger or discouragement, we are to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord is what verse 4 says. Okay? Do you know that that, that word, the, the Greek word bring them up is ektrepho, ektrepho, 
E-K-T-R-E-P-H-O, ektrepho. It's the same word in verse 29 of chapter 5 about nourish, that just as Christ nourished and cherished his, his bride. It's the same word in verse 29, right? For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. When he's talking about husbands nourishing and cherishing their wives. It's the same word. Bring them up. Discipline, see, is not, a, is not an end. It's a means. Discipline is not, we don't discipline them for discipline's sake. It's a means to get something else. It's a means by which we nourish them. And so if we discipline with the idea of nourishing them and cherishing them, then our discipline becomes much different. Amen? And God's the same with us. So when he disciplines us, it's because he cherishes us and he's nourishing us. And so discipline is the means by which we nourish our children. And so the Lord, as we uh, parents also, we use discipline as a, as a means to the ends of nourishing and cherishing our kids. Got it? All right. Hebrews 12, 7 and 8 says this. I love it. It's for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Because he's nourishing him. But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. So, we as parents must nourish and cherish and discipline our kids from that perspective. And so men, do we, do we nourish and cherish and legitimize our kids so that they're legitimate children? And this must be done in the Lord. There's no other way. It must be done in the Lord. And that's what verse 1 and verse 4 says. Look at it. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Verse 4, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of of the Lord or in the Lord. So what that means, mom and dad, is this. How can our kids possibly obey in the Lord if we as parents are not in the Lord ourselves? We're asking too much of them. How can our kids possibly obey in the Lord if we are not in the Lord ourselves? I... I I, I'm sure many of you, I don't even know the, the statistics. I just didn't have time. But there's just some staggering statistics about kids that are struggling, not doing well. And almost always, it points back to the father. Almost always. Not being the father that God has called us to be. The Lord knows what he's doing. And so you have a lot of angry and discouraged kids out there, and dads, we must be very, very careful. We'll wrap up with a few little things here. When the Supreme Court handed down its ruling against required prayer in public schools, the famous editorial cartoonist Herblock published a cartoon in the Washington Post showing an angry father waving a newspaper at his family and shouting, what do they expect us to do? Listen to the kids pray at home? The answer is yes. Yeah. Home is the place where the children ought to learn about the Lord. Amen? Let me close with this. One commentary says this about this topic, the submission being filled with the Spirit. It says, it, it seems no matter where we look in our modern society, we see antagonism, division, rebellion. Husbands and wives are divorcing each other. Children are rebelling against their parents. And employers and employees are seeking for new ways to avoid strikes and keep the industry running productively. We have tried education. We have tried legislation and every other approach. But nothing seems to be working, does it? Paul's solution to this antagonism in the home and in society was regeneration. Being filled with the Spirit and being submissive. It's a new heart from God and a, and a new submission to Christ and to one another. God's great program is to gather together in one all things in Christ, which is Ephesians 1.10. Paul indicated that this spiritual harmony begins in the lives of Christians who are submitted to the Lordship of Christ. And so I say it again. 
A proper fill. A proper fill. A fear will lead to a proper fill. A proper fear of God is what's going to drive us to a proper filling of His Spirit so that we can be all these things that we're to be to one another. Amen? You know, it's just, it's, I'm, I'm done. I'm going to pray in a second, but um, there are times where I, I'm, I'm amazed and I'm encouraged when I read Scripture and, you, and you, all the things about how, we're, how we can and how we're commanded to get along and to submit and to work out our issues, and yet oftentimes it just doesn't happen. And then there's division in families, there's divisions in, 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 in societies and schools and in churches, and you think, what the heck? And I think part of it is we just don't have a proper fear. And so then we don't have a proper filling of the Holy Spirit. And then things start to fall apart. And so one of the things we do by doing this is just continuing to have a proper fear so that we can drop to our knees and just say, oh, Lord God, I can't do it on my own. Amen? Yeah. It's just so good. God has so many great things for us. He's carved out a perfect plan of how this all works. But boy, we have to have a proper fear so that we're filled properly. Let me pray, and then if you need prayer, we have some people from our prayer team over here. If you need some prayer after service, please go see them. Almighty God, we thank you for your grace and your patience as you continue to work in us a proper fear of you. God, we want to have a reverence for you that just continues to grow and be more clear that you are the Almighty, that you are the Most High, that you are awesome, so that we would recognize that we desperately need to be filled by the power of your Holy Spirit, so that we can be submissive to you and submissive to one another, that we can serve and love on our kids and cherish and nourish them, that we can serve and love on our wives and cherish and nurture them and serve and love on our employees and our employers. And Lord, it, it's, it's a perfect plan, but never in the flesh. So we thank you, we love you, and we just, we beg for your help, Holy Spirit. Fill us in new and mighty ways. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thanks, you guys. Have a great rest of the weekend. Good to see you all.